Good morning, Abundant Life. Let's stand. Um, it's so good to be together, to worship together in unity. Uh, this past week has been really heavy on my heart, praying for people that need a touch from the Lord. And I was praying last night, and this song kept coming to my mind, and I just felt that we need to be reminded of these words this morning. Because he lives. Because he
you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn
she changed everything Laps, healed, hope, found Here, now Jesus, you change everything Change
So make me your vessel so make me an offering Make me whatever you want me to be I came here with nothing But all you have given me Jesus, bring new wine out of me. 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 a church family this morning uh, after two weeks or longer in the hospital and most of that time on a ventilator we lost a young man that grew up in our church has been part of our church family almost all of his life Daryl Canteen left us yesterday and is in heaven today he has always been a special young man, one of God's special children, harmless, and uh, he and his five siblings and mom and dad would worship over here in this section. Our prayers this morning are with Reggie and Carla, the mom and dad, and with Daryl's brothers and sisters. Isn't heaven going to be a wonderful thing when we all get there together. Also mention other prayer requests. We have many as you can see, even some in our praise team are not here today. They are at home and uh, will be fine for the most part. Our prayers are with uh, all of them that you don't see here this morning. I do want to mention a few names because these are our members who are in the hospital this morning. Of course, uh, the Khaki White family. They're going through a challenge. Khaki's fine. He's at home. But his wife, Miss Mamie, Kathy, uh, Khaki usually joins the team right up here. But his wife, Miss Mamie, is in 
the hospital in ICU. And uh, so is their daughter, Deidre Ricks. Deidre and Ronald sit right over here. And uh, our prayers are with both of those ladies. And then one other lady who's a new member of our church, Miss Judith Bofar. And she's a fourth grade teacher at uh, Lester Elementary School. She is in the hospital this morning. All of them, uh, we believe, will be fine. But our prayers are with them. And, and uh, how many of you have something going on at your house? You could use a little prayer. Well, I'll just give you the word right now. God's going to speak to that need. And he's already decided exactly how and when. He's going to meet every need at your house. It's good to see all of you here before you're seated. Turn around and wave at one another and welcome somebody at Abundant Life. If you're, if you're home watching by live stream, send up a heart or two right now. Thank you, praise and worship team. I will say this because we don't get a chance to say it that often. But how wonderful it is to have our homegrown missionaries, Pastor Brian and Millie Hudson, stand if you will. Also good to see their son Paul, Mama Gloria, and who's this young lady beside you here? Oh, good. Well, it's, it's great to have uh, you special folks with us this morning. Thank you for being here, Brian and Millie, home from Nicaragua. Uh, just for a few days, spending time with their wonderful family. It's always good to be with uh, them and to have them here in our services. I do want to, to say that this week, Abundant Life Church celebrates 35 years of ministry. And God has been good to us every single day during this time. I want to say that... Uh, uh, I appreciate your faithfulness to the work of God. I don't know of uh, many churches our size that have had the impact not only on our local community, but also on world missions and uh, reaching the nations of the world. That's our passion and that's our heartbeat and we appreciate you for being a part of that. And can we thank God for his goodness to our church for 35 years and counting. He's always been good. I don't expect he'll change. I expect fully him to continue being good to his people. And thank you for being a part of that. Well, we mark today. It's a special day. And, uh, and to celebrate Together, we have a guest speaker. It is a joy to have Philip Miles with us this morning. He and his wife, Lynn, are dear friends to us. We go back decades. Uh, Philip's dad was our bishop, Houston Miles. So uh, we all grew up together under his uh, covering, and uh, we're grateful for the legacy he left Philip Miles is a church planter. He founded Christ Community Church and served as lead pastor for 37 years. And just two or three years ago, as he stepped down from that position, today the church he founded is a satellite campus of one of America's greatest mega churches, a Seacoast Church. And uh, if you're on the way to the beach, you can't miss Seacoast Church. They are right there. You have to go around it almost to get from here to there. And, but we appreciate their life. Today, Philip is chairman of Evangel Fellowship International. It is a global network of churches like Abundant Life and pastors like myself who share one thing in common, and that is to reach the nations of the world with the gospel. EFI, under Philip's leadership, is one of the major forces in the kingdom of God today in church planting initiatives in third world nations. EFI has hundreds of pastors like me and churches like ours and missionaries in dozens of countries serving today. Philip, we appreciate being a part of what God is doing 
in your life and especially through EFI. It's the tribe we belong to, and it's a wonderful thing to have Philip with us this morning. Would you make welcome Philip Miles as he comes to share the word with us? Hey, thank you, Carl. Well, it's, just, uh, it's good to be here, and uh, Carl and Brenda have been friends for a long time. You know, the thing about Carl that uh, you probably already know is Carl, he doesn't just do good things. Carl is actually a good person. I mean, he really is. He just can't help it. He's just good through and through. He reminds me of my dad a lot in that he just, uh, it's just his nature to, to try to be a blessing and try to be good to, uh, in every way. And Brenda, is a, she's going to get a special crown for having to uh, help Carl out <coughs> in a lot of his ways. It's, it's a joy to have Lynn with me. She doesn't always get to come, but uh, it's always good to have her here. And it's good for you because if I say something that's not true, she'll nod her head to the negative, okay? So if, you, if I say something a little controversial, just look at her and, and you'll know if it was actually true or not. And uh, it's good to see Brian and Millie. That's an unexpected blessing. And uh, Paul... And uh, they're doing such a good work there, and uh, they've been so faithful. And I know that we're all hungry for a move of God in Nicaragua. And so I, I know they appreciate your uh, prayers and support for what God's doing there. And, uh, you know, we, we think we're having it hard, but when you go out of this country and go into other nations, I, I'll be going in October. Um, these people are really having it hard. You know, we go into Mexico and Guatemala, and the stories, you know, just like some of the stories we hear here, you can just multiply those stories, and, uh, and it's really, uh, we really need to pray. This COVID, it's been an attack, not just on the world, but especially on the church, yeah. and uh, we really need to come against it. I do believe it's a scheme of the enemy, and I think that we can begin to take a stand against it, and believe God for better things. Uh, today, what I want to do is, uh, I'm actually going to spend the first part of my message as like an introduction, and uh, my text is on Luke chapter 6, and verse 27, and, it's, and uh, he says, but I say to you uh, who here love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. And when you see the word do good, what I want you to think of is the word to add value. And uh, that's kind of what I want to talk about today, that how we can really value other people. Even in the midst of our own struggle, God wants us to be a blessing to other people. And so um, I think it's important that we still stay focused on our relationship with others because with one tiny exception... The entire world consists of others. I mean, it's all about, like, other people. That's why Jesus came, and, and that's why we're here. It's all about how we can impact and touch other people. And so to be a blessing, there are certain things that we obviously uh, need to deal with and overcome. You know, military has boot camp. God has the church. Welcome. And... Um, and so we're here today to prepare ourselves for what God has for us. And so I think when it comes to, to being a blessing, and, and for God wants to use all of us in great ways, but I think it's uh, to, to the, really the very first challenge that we have is just overcoming our own stuff. You know, we all have problems, we all have issues, and we have to figure out a way to move beyond ourselves and beyond our own issues and struggles, I can't, I can't help you if I'm wrapped up in my own challenges and I'm wrapped up in my own issues and struggles. I cannot help you. And so we all, all of us here have challenges. We all have problems. I'm going to tell you, every one of us here has a story to tell. And, uh, and we would all be shocked if we knew everything that you've been having to contend with and deal with. Because, you know, you hear somebody about COVID, but then what you don't really hear about is the whole the family that's having to make adjustments to care for that person, minister, to help, the suffering. You know what I'm saying? It just, and so, and then, 
you know, just the whole other issues of just trying to stay alive, make, make a living, uh, raise our families. Everybody has a story to tell. But to get to the place where we can really be the blessing that God wants us to be, we, we have to deal with some of the own stuff that we all are contending with. And, and we never use our struggle as an excuse to not do something. In fact, the Bible teaches us that we use our struggle to gain a better understanding, gain greater compassion, so that we can help other people. And that's really the kind of how God takes pain and turns it into a blessing and into progress in our life. And that's kind of the plan. Some people, you know, uh, some of us deal with darker issues like blame and resentment, hatred, unforgiveness, things like that. And those deeper issues make it more difficult to see beyond ourselves. And uh, plus it makes us feel like a victim. And that, that's really something that paralyzes the body of Christ when once we begin to feel like, you know, we have become a victim of circumstances. And if we're honest, every one of us here have had to deal with some of these deeper issues. Every, every one of us. And many still are. So how do we overcome this? How do we overcome these toxic forces that want to keep you suppressed, that want to keep you so wrapped up in your pain and your hurt and your struggle and your disappointments that you're really unable to be a blessing because you really can't see beyond yourself because maybe you're struggling and you're having such pain or difficulty? How do we do that? And so I think one of the first things is knowing that this, this challenge, this struggle is universal, okay? And a lot of times we think we've got it worse than anybody, but if, like I said, if, if we had a chance to listen, we'd find out there are people that have it a lot worse than we do. And so it's not like we don't have a struggle because we're bad. We, we have a struggle because we're breathing. And it's just, it's life. And so don't, you know, when we talk about, please, you know, I want us to be set free of, you know, well, I have a struggle, therefore I'm doing something wrong or something like that. That, you know, that's... That's not really what I'm talking about. The first step, though, is I think it, it, as we all can come together and we can all admit we're, we're broken in some way. We're broken in some way. We all need healing in some areas. And I think that's a very important first step for us. So we're, none of us are perfect. We all have struggles. And so why am I talking about that? Because I haven't gotten into my message yet. Um, because you can't give away what you've never received. And so we have to receive healing. We have to receive love. We have to receive forgiveness if we're going to offer it to the world. And so I think this is, this is why this is like a big deal. It's why I'm taking a little bit of time to talk about this. And so uh, to value others, we have to find our personal freedom so we can clearly see what people are struggling with and dealing with. So I guess the biggest thing, before you can add value to other people, you have to take full ownership of your own life. That's the whole kind of bottom line of this. No one can make you angry. No one can make you violent. No one can make you curse. No one can make you, you know, anything. It's a choice. We have to take ownership of our life and what we do and what we say and the choices we make. And believe me, that's like the bottom line. It has to actually start there. And I'll come back to this a little bit later on down the line. But you think about it, until you take ownership, not even God can help you. It's really something, it's, it's startling because it says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful. Did you know if, if a person is not willing to confess, you know, take ownership, not even God. God says, you know, I, probably, you know, I guess God could, but he chooses, he says, no, I'm not, I'm not going to. That is the beginning place. And so I think in a lot of our lives, even, and I don't want to get ahead of myself because I really believe that's why God sent me here to, to deal with this topic but uh, I'm, I'm going to wait later. But I think it's so important because that's the, that's the beginning point of where change happens in, in our hearts and lives. Somebody put it like this, if it's somebody else's fault, then somebody else needs forgiveness. 
So once we begin this, then we get ourselves in a position that we finally can see other people as God sees them. Once we begin this process of, of healing and taking responsibility, we're ready to bless others. So I'm going to give you three things you must know. You ready? This is the message. Three things you must know to bless others, to add value. They're important. They're not profound, but they're important. Number one, our words have power. If you just say it, if you can humor me, just say this. My words have power. Say that. My words have power. Now, you, you may not feel that way. You may not feel very powerful. But the fact is, your words have incredible power. And your words have power not because you're wise or smart or good. Your words have power because you're made in the image of God. In fact, did you know that every person's word, regardless of their faith, has power? I was thinking about this. Um, when I was in college, I, was, um, I think I was a sophomore, and I was sort of dating a girl named Sally. And, um, and so we were doing the intramural football uh, games. It's a Bible college, and so everything was intramural. And so, um, and so after a game, I was walking off the field, and, and Sally was uh, sitting there on the bleachers. And uh, as I walked up, she said, you have such broad shoulders. Now, that was probably 50 years ago, maybe even 50 years ago today. I don't remember the day, but that was 50 years ago. Now, let's be honest. I, I'm pretty sure I didn't and still don't have broad shoulders, okay? In fact, a, a, a friend of mine who's passed away, he was the superintendent of the assemblies in South Carolina. His name was Victor Smith. And uh, he roomed a couple rooms down, and Victor one time told me, he said, your chest looks like the inside of a spoon. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> anyway, um, even though it probably wasn't actually factual what she said, but did you know that I, I can still remember actually where I was standing yeah. when she said that? You know, your, did you know your words have power? Your words have power, not because you're this or that. It's just the way, it's just the way God designed it. I have a friend of mine and, uh, who passed away a few years back, and he was telling me that when he was in the first grade, and he, he remembered the little girl's name, she walked up to him and she said, You have a big nose. Well, when he told me this, that had been probably 50 years at least. And guess what he saw every time he looked in the mirror for 50 years? And so we, our words, it's crazy, isn't it? It's really crazy how much power our words, our words have. Listen, in fact, we're going to do a little experiment. Can you humor me for a moment? And uh, I, want you to, I want you to turn around and look at somebody, kind of get eye contact with them, and just, and I'm not going to ask you to hold their hand, so don't worry. Uh, I'm just getting out and just and just look at them and say, hey, you know, you look uh, kind of smile. Say, hey, you look nice today. Hey, you look nice today. Tell, tell them. Now you know, even though you know that statement was coerced, it still felt good. It still felt good. It may not even been sincere, but it still felt good. Why? Because, because words, because words are powerful. And so we can use words for the kingdom. And we can use words to build up. It can build up and obviously it can tear down. Words have a lot of power. And I, I, this sentence came to me. Sometimes saying the right thing can lead, uh, can lead to feeling the right way. Sometimes saying the right thing can lead to feeling the right way. What is that? What am I saying? Is that sometimes when you say something positive or affirming, you may not necessarily feel very positive. If you say something loving, you may not feel real loving. But you know, sometimes... After you say it, the feeling can come. 
You know, you can't feel your way into an action, but you can act your way into a feeling. Some of us just need to start doing the right thing. Quit waiting until we feel like doing it because, you know, the devil will make sure you never feel like it. But if you just start getting obedient, start doing what's right, the feelings will follow suit. That's just sort of how that works. And so our words are powerful. Our words are powerful. In Matthew chapter 12, and verse 36, And I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. That's sort of strong, isn't it? I mean, the word idle means negative. I mean, really, every, every idle word. And so why the kind of extreme consequences? Well, I'm going to tell you, because words matter. You wouldn't be held accountable if they didn't make, you know, if it didn't mean anything. Why would you be held accountable? Well, we are because why? Because the things we say. And I didn't use the scripture. Remember, if you call somebody a fool, remember that scripture? It says you'll be in danger of hellfire. Because words, words mean something. Words make a difference. Words really matter. We can use words to build up, to tear down. Or we can use our words to make a difference in people's lives around us. Number two, what's important is we all have value. Did you say that with me? I have value. Say it. I have value. Again, you do whether you feel like it or not. You have value because God made you. Every person has value. Every person on the planet has value. Because God values people, he wants us to value people. And just think about what a privilege that we have the, the ability to add value to people, to help people, to give people something they don't have right now. We, we, can, we can do that. That's pretty amazing power that God's given us. And it's not associated right, with um, you know, spiritual gifts or things like that. In fact, in Mark chapter 9 and verse 41, he says, If anyone gives you even a cup of water because you belong to the Messiah, I tell you the truth, that person will surely be rewarded. I think it's important to know that there, there's no such thing as the gift of cup of water. You know, there's no cup of water gift. It's like it says, if anyone. And then he says also, you're going to get a reward for just something simple. And I don't know about you. I like rewards, I'll just be honest. And apparently God knows that we like it because he keeps offering them all the time, you know. And so apparently rewards are important, and so if you don't like rewards, I'll take yours, okay? So that's fine. I'm, I'm very happy to do that. And, and so it, it's, it's very important that uh, if, if you do something to be a blessing, there's like a reward. And I think the same thing when we say things that are uplifting, it's a reward. And so showing God's love must become intentional, and uh, you're going to never, you're not going to meet anybody today who doesn't need to be valued. Everybody does. So let me ask you a question. You can just answer yes or no. Do you believe God values people? Okay. Do you believe God values people you don't know? Do you believe God values people you don't like? Oh, okay. That was strong. I like that. So every person has value. You know, when I was in college, um, there was a student there, and I think now as I look back on it, I actually just thought of this, probably had a, a struggle with autism, but back then, you know, we didn't really know about that word or anything like that. And um, his name was Robert. And, um, and Robert, uh, his, 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 he lived with his mother in an apartment in Atlanta and raised up under her heart, you know, strong covering. And, um, and so she sent him down there to, I guess, help him grow up and things like that. But Robert was socially backwards. He didn't know how to talk to people. He couldn't look you in the eye. Um, when Robert would get mad, he'd spit on you, you know. And uh, he, uh, you know, when Robert would shave, 
he would shave with an electric razor up and down the side of his head. He didn't have any hair on the side of his head, you know, and he'd just go up and down, you know. And he was pretty entertaining for us. And, uh, and so Robert would, um, he would, he would sit, when we would sit in the lobby, you know, he would, he would rock back and forth like this. And he'd say, I'm going to get me a woman. And we were like, whoo, lucky girl, you know. And, uh, but anyway, you, you remember me mentioning the girl Sally to you earlier? Well, Sally had a sister named Sue. And Sally and Sue felt sorry for Robert. And Robert, you know, when Robert would dress, he would have like check shirt, striped pants, and speckle socks or whatever, you know. He, he really just was something to behold. And uh, so Sally and Sue took an interest in Robert. And so they began to take time with him. They, they took him down to uh, like the thrift store and helped him get clothes that actually matched. They talked to him and told him, Robert, you know, you really shouldn't spit on people. That's not going to help you make friends. And that, that's not how you relate to people. And uh, and, and, and just begin to coach him on how to shave and how to act and stuff. And, and it was really interesting, too, because you could see Robert change. You could see him. He, he acted, started acting more like a normal person. He, could, he, he got where he could sort of look in the eye and talk to you. And I realized that um, their love and acceptance of him was transformative. They saw value in Robert. I could have done that, but I chose to stay with the crowd and make fun and try to do things to make Robert scream, show out, or say every now and then say bad words. That didn't happen a lot in Bible college, so it was always a special treat if we get Robert to cuss. And so, uh, but in, in, instead of... Uh, so instead of being part of a blessing to Robert, I, I would just sort of fit in. But for Sally and Sue, they saw value. And I'm going to tell you, it was transformative. He literally was a different person by the end of the semester. And the Lord told me one day, you could have been a friend to Robert. And I knew it was true. So everyone deserves to receive value in their life. John Maxwell put it this way, you're going to have to make a decision. Are you going to spend your life correcting people or connecting with people? I mean, you're going to spend your life judging. Are you going to spend your life blessing? You can't do both, by the way. Number three, and this is my last point. We're almost done. It takes God's love to see value in others. It takes God's love. Apparently, I didn't have that back in the day. Uh, but I realize this. We need God's help to do this. And I think, really, it's true. I mean, none of us are really that good. Maybe Carl, but apart from him. You know, we're, we're just not that good, you know. We, we do, honestly, we need God's help. We need God's help to see other people as he sees them. And uh, it's just too easy to make a snap judgment. And isn't it the truth that the people who need it the most deserve it the least? Isn't that the truth? I remember a story that always touched me because it, um, it was so not like me. But it was the story of D.L. Moody, who was a great Bible uh, teacher and Chicago has the Moody Bible Institute, and he was at a party one night uh, with a, as kind of the socialites of the city invited him, and it, during the party there was a guy there that uh, had too much to drink, and uh, he di he didn't know Dr. Moody. He kept coming up to him, <laughs> trying to you know get him some some alcohol, and and uh, Dr. Moody you know kept declining and. And then he would come, ah, oh, come on, man, you know, and he would decline. And so finally somebody pulled the guy over to the side and said, do you know who that is? That's Dr. D.L. Moody, the most esteemed man of God in our entire city. And so 
The night was kind of winding down, and he eventually worked his way over to Dr. Moody. And he says, well, I guess you think I'm the worst sinner you've ever seen in your life. Dr. Moody said, oh, well, quite the contrary. I was thinking you're probably one of the most generous people I've ever met. It wasn't long, but he was able to lead him to the Lord. So you either spend your life kind of correcting people or you, you spend your life trying to connect, trying to look for the value. And thank God Dr. Moody saw value in this person. It made a difference. Of course, Jesus is the one that sets the example in all this. You remember uh, when he was on the cross, it says in, in Luke 23, 39 and through 42, it says, one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, said, you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God? Even when you've been sentenced to die, we deserve to die for our crime, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Let's just stop for a moment. This guy, don't you imagine that uh, his mother put him on a prayer list for every synagogue in Jerusalem? They had been praying for this boy, he was, but he was un incorrigible. You know, he never listened. They probably warned him all of his life. You're going to end up like this if you keep going the way you're going. And indeed, the Roman government uh, felt like he was so recalcitrant that it was impossible to re rehab this guy, and so they sentenced him to death too. I mean, what a class act loser if there ever was one. But what did Jesus see? I think it's I think it's significant. And uh, I remind you, Jesus never saves junk. He doesn't die for junk. And he turns to this guy and says, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. It's really something. This blood-soaked, dirt-encrusted, whoremongering, wasted life of a man, Jesus could see value. And he opened up his heart. And I think that uh, it goes back to what we were talking about. Uh, amazingly wonderful things can happen when we take ownership of our life. I'm guessing it's probably the first time this guy in his entire life has ever said, you know what? I deserve this. That's what he told it. That we, we deserve this. You know, we... We rejected all sound wisdom all of our life. We have done nothing but hurt people, take advantage of people, and here we are, and I deserve what I'm getting. And, and you know, with the Lord, I found out that if you're willing to take ownership, he's there. I mean, it was, like a, it was not a problem. The moment he took ownership of his life, the doors to the kingdom were wide open to him. And so, I think about us today. Um, we have a lot of significant choices to make. And the first choice for a lot of us is really beginning to take full ownership of our life. And so, I, I feel like that there's been a lot of people here, and, and good people, good people, people that love the Lord. But some of us have been stuck. We've been stuck for a long time. We've been stuck with a low grade of anger in our life. We've been stuck at a frustration and stuck with a, a level of resentment that just doesn't seem to go away. Doesn't always show. It pops out here and there. But part of the challenge is, is that what we've done is we've tended to blame other people in other situations. It's my parents. They never gave me the affirmation I needed as a child. That's why I'm hard and harsh. It's my spouse. They 
couldn't control their spending. That's why we're having such financial problems. And we've, we've always just sort of pushed it off on, on other people. And what's happened is, is that the result has been that we haven't changed. We haven't grown. We haven't been able to move beyond where we are. Good, good people. You love the Lord. But until we're willing to really step up and take really ownership for our attitudes and our actions, there's not going to be any change. And I mean, it's just a sad thing to think about living your entire life with the struggle that we don't have to have. If we're willing just to say, Lord, it's not, it's not them, it's me. It's the choices I have made. It's, it's what, the way I've chose to react. That's what's causing me the pain and frustration in my life. And I want us to stop for a moment, and I actually just want us to deal with this, because it's, it's, such, a, it's such an issue, and it's such a thief. I want us to pray. And I'd like if you would, if you could just bow your heads with me just for a moment. Just, just bow your heads. And you say, Pastor Philip, I have been stuck. I have been contending with this frustration, anger, hurt. I can't seem to move past it. I've been done wrong, I've, I've had abuse, but I know God has the power to bring healing, and I want to move past this. If you're in that battle, I just want you to slip your hand up real quick and just put it down and just say, you know what, I've, I've been, yes, thank you. I've been struggling, it's been frustration, thank you, thank you. It's been hard to overcome. I've been dealing with this for quite some time. Thank you. I really believe God wants to come through for us today and help help us. But again, it's a matter of taking ownership. You can stay the way you are the rest of your life, or we can take ownership. And I'll take five more seconds if you say, Pastor Gill, it's been a struggle. I need some prayer. I want to give you an opportunity. All right. Thank you. So, Father, we, we come before you now, and we just repent. We repent for our attitudes. We repent for the anger, the frustration. We just repent, Lord. We say that we're sorry. And, Lord, right now, I, we choose not to blame any longer. If it's someone else's fault, then they need forgiveness, Lord. But this is our choice. We've made these choices. And so, Lord, we'd just like to say right now, forgive me and give me grace. Forgive me and help me show kindness and love. Take away that frustration and the anger. Lord, I confess right now I need you. I confess right now, Lord, your grace is sufficient. And I thank you, Lord, for meeting me right where I am as I honestly come before you and as I sincerely take ownership of my life and just say, God, I've been wrong. There's been no justification. And I thank you, Lord, for cleansing me completely and fully and replacing the frustration with peace and kindness and love. I thank you, God, for touching each person that raised their hand. And let, Lord, let their peace of God flood their hearts right now. And let them have peace with one another. Thank you for that, Lord. And then my last point is you can decide to be a blessing. You certainly can. You can decide right now to actually add value to every, every person. You say, I just don't know if I can do that. But I'm just saying, though, like I shared before, we have to have God's help. And so 
what I want you to think of as we leave here today is I want you to, to say, Lord, would you help open my eyes? Because, you know, I'm an only child, by the way. And so this has been a hard journey for me. Because I just don't really, I, you know, I grow up, I didn't have to share, I didn't have to do all those things that an only child does, you know. I go in, if I'm hungry, I make a sandwich, and I go, oh, I wonder if Lynn's hungry. Now, you know, it's just like, you know, I've just always lived in my world here. And so this whole concept of realizing there's, there's, a, there's other people out there, and, and God loves them, and he wants me to love them. This has actually been a, this is a process that didn't come easy for me. But it's, it's really become a way of life now, and I love it. And so for this church, just think about what the impact you could make on this community if we all walked out of this building sensitive to the Holy Spirit, praying that God would use us, and every person we meet, we would choose to add value. You know, the quick encounter, sometimes the only value you can give is just a smile. Might be the only one they've had in a long time. But then as you've had more time, you can pray and God can show you. You can say something. Man, you're a fantastic waitress. Hey, I want you to never have told you, but you're a great neighbor. It's awesome to have you as a neighbor. And as we just go around it with all of the things at work, you know, just people that we interact with, if we can just find a way, if we ask God to use us to somehow lift them up just a little bit. And you know, I found out when you lift other people up, you get lifted up in the process. It's funny how that works. And so I know that I know that God wants to use you. I know that you've been taught the right way here. And so a lot of this, obviously, you, you already know. But today will just be another kind of reminder to say, you know what? Let's make every day count for the Lord. And let's be a blessing because I don't think there's any such thing for a believer as a chance encounter. So I pray God bless you continue to prosper you, and may God's protection be upon this body. Thank you, Carl. Love you. Thank you, Philip. Stand with me, if you will. Philip, thank you for that uh, wonderful word. And in fact, it's a great word to begin a new season in your life and a new season in our church. And it's easy to apply to. If we'll just swallow it, it's an easy word to apply. So uh, begin a new season with this word. Philip, I also want to say to you that um, we're grateful you did not settle for Sally. <laughs> and you held out for Lynn. She completes you. You got the right girl. And uh, thank you so much, Philip and Lynn, for being with us on a special day and to all of you. God bless you. Have a great week and we'll see you again next Sunday.